Ms. Hansberry, can you call IT? I can't figure out how to get the gallery machine connected. Yes, sir. Thank you. try to get started um can you see what's going on on the two i was trying to get the big screen on technical difficulties the two little screens can you see there's a zoom screen great all right thank you are we live at the wheeler correctional facility can we have you join us Good morning, Wheeler. That's a good sign. Just need video. So during, I don't know where the feedback is coming from. <laughs> is it you? Yes. Okay. Okay. You good? Nope. If you just mute. We'll find out. Yep. <clears throat> Oh, you're off? You're off. Great. Okay. Um, good morning, Ms. Maxwell. How are you? Sorry, Your Honor. I'm fine. Thank you. Good morning. And I don't want to mispronounce your last name. Is it Jung Young? How would you say it, sir? It, it's Young, Your Honor. Young. All right. Good afternoon. Good morning, uh, Mr. Young. Um, we are here. Uh, we can't start quite yet because I cannot see Mr. Lucky, but um, maybe the camera needs to pop out of the computer um, uh, down in Wheeler. They slide that little thing over. Um, but uh, we are here for a sentence modification in Mr. Lucky's case. 
um, we'll get on the record in a minute, um, but I'm hoping that um, folks down in Wheeler can work on the, we, there's a video connection. I can see that, um, but we don't see Mr. Lucky. Mr. Lucky, can you hear us? Ms. Hansberry, if you could be reaching out to the Department of Corrections, um, I think Ms. Willis is her name. I'm on it. Great, thank you. So to our viewing audience, um, during the pandemic, the Department of Corrections invested a great deal in connectivity. You wouldn't notice it right now, um, <laughs> but they installed at every DOC facility of which there are dozens, the ability for an inmate to go into a private room um, and uh, appear via Zoom. Originally, it was a different technology that no one else had and Zoom kind of crushed that out of existence. And so um, it's Zoom um, in all those facilities. Real helpful because transportation is expensive. Transportation is dangerous. Um, we've lost a number of DOC employees because someone High risk is being transported, and he views that as an opportunity to not be in custody anymore, and, and, and bad stuff can happen. And so DOC's default would be, could we please have this person stay put if what's happening could occur consistent with the defendant's due process rights with the defendant remaining at the facility? This is something that inures 100% to Mr. Lucky's benefit. He's not going to be contesting any of it. So it's appropriate for him to be there. Um, we can't start till I can see and hear him and vice versa. So they're working on that. Um, but it's been a real valuable investment um, in another way as well. Um, Mr. Lucky was convicted of something. Um, looks like it's possession of heroin with intent to distribute. Got a big old sentence. Um, Mr. Young doesn't have to travel all the way to Wheeler. Where is Wheeler, Mr. Young? Do you know? It is the middle of rural Georgia, Your Honor. Um, Where most prisons are. Yes, Judge. Um, but uh, because of this setup, Mr. Young doesn't need to go down there every time he wants to connect with his client. He might for that initial to establish a rapport, but if he's given him a five minute update or he's got a question, hey, I wanna make sure my brief is right. Tell me again what happened. DOC can get Mr. Lucky into that space. It's private, no one's listening to the privileged conversation and they can connect. Um, and that's a savings for everyone because otherwise it's four hours down for Mr. Young, four hours back. And all he's done that day is have a five minute conversation with Mr. Lucky. So it's, it's been a huge advance in particular on that ability for lawyer and client to have meaningful, not I write you a letter because <laughs> that's the way it's, because they don't have email. Um, the inmates don't have email. So it's, I write you a letter, put it in the mailbox, hope it makes it. Of course, it gets searched when it gets to the prison and then it gets to the inmate. And that's um, like Pony Express days. So this is good stuff um, when it works. So we'll figure out if uh, Wheeler can um, sort out the video piece. Um, Mr. Young, why don't you get us oriented with what um, the objective is, and then I'll hear from Ms. Maxwell um, uh, about that, and then we'll get it all on the record once we know Mr. Lucky is part of, of what we're doing, okay? Sure, Your Honor. Um, Judge, this was uh, trying to think of the best place to start here. Um, I, I'll, I'll start with the motion itself, Your Honor. This is a jointly filed motion that was presented by both parties. Uh, as signatories. Uh, Your Honor, the first mechanism that we filed in order to uh, get Mr. Lucky a new sentence was, of course, as the court knows, an extraordinary motion for new trial. There was some discussions um, during previous hearings with, I believe, Ms. Maxwell, where uh, Your Honor recommended that we withdraw the extraordinary motion and instead file a motion to modify. Uh, and that is what has been filed um, and what we are, I believe, appearing on today is the motion to modify Mr. Lucky's sentence. Judge, back in 2005, Mr. Excuse me, back in 2004, Mr. Lucky was arrested for possession of heroin, heroin with the intent to distribute and uh, a misdemeanor for, um, I, I can't remember the code section, but effectively discarding um, that was the allegation during the investigation. Um, Your Honor, Mr. Lucky went to trial in 2005, lost that trial, and was convicted. Um, the sentence that he received was in accordance with 17107C. Uh, the state had noticed Mr. Um, Lucky as a recidivist, 
And so he was uh, when he was sentenced to 30 serve 25, uh, that 25 would be to the door, which would see Mr. Lucky uh, under his current sentence uh, with a release date in 2030, April of 2030. Um, Your Honor, this motion um, is filed again in tandem with the DA's office, with the Conviction Integrity Unit, um, uh, of which Ms. Maxwell is the head of. And um, Your Honor, this is in an attempt to um, get some leniency for Mr. Lucky, who has served 18 years, seven months, and three days of that sentence. What we're requesting would be a modification of that sentence from 30 to 25 to 30 to 20. So he would have a little less than a year and a half left on his sentence, um, which we believe would line him up, uh, I think, almost perfectly to start uh, getting transitioned from his current facility at Wheeler to uh, a transition facility run by Georgia Department of Corrections, which would help him get set up for um, an eventual release in uh, 2025. Um, Your Honor, I would be happy to go into the background of my relationship with the Conviction Integrity Unit. Uh, Judge, uh, I'm not sure if the court is aware, I'm one of the appellate attorneys with the Fulton County Public Defender's Office, and I... Um, about maybe two and a half, three years ago, right, Ms. Maxwell was, I guess, deigned the counterpart to the Conviction Integrity Unit in, in the PD's office. So uh, Ms. Maxwell and I have done a number of these cases together, and, and I would be happy to speak as to the history of it, but I think Ms. Maxwell, being the supervisor of it, might be more appropriately positioned to explain that portion, Judge. Sure, why don't we take this opportunity, um, so you all know, you may have been informed, we have a, a, an audience here of about a fifth of this year's Leadership Atlanta class. Today is Criminal Justice Day, and um, they were advised that we're doing two things this morning. We're taking a plea, and we're doing the sentence modification, assuming we can get Wheeler back online. Um, and so I think it would be instructive, Ms. Maxwell, if you help this group understand what conviction integrity means, because um, that's susceptible to lots of interpretations. And then if you could do a little quantifying, how many of these situations, like Mr. Lucky's, has your office engaged in where you've concluded that there was a, set, a lawful sentence um, because 30 to do 25 is, is definitely within the statutory range, but upon further review, it was concluded that maybe it was a disproportionate sentence. And so um, uh, together, the state and um, the defense side petitioned the court um, to look at maybe modifying that sentence for whatever reasons you advance. Well, yes, that, I, I would love to talk about the Conviction Integrity Unit. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so DA Fonnie Willis created the Conviction Integrity Unit with the idea that sometimes either we get it wrong or we change our attitudes towards crimes and sentencing. And that's really what we're here today um, on. So the Conviction Integrity Unit looks at two different kinds of cases. We look at actual innocence and we look at unjust sentencing. So that's a those are both very broad. Well, actually, actual innocence isn't broad. Either you're guilty or you're innocent in, in our book. So actual innocence, we look at cases where people have been wrongfully convicted. And you've probably seen in the news and uh, on television and movies, cases where people have been convicted and DNA proves their innocence. So that's really kind of the gold standard, those DNA cases. And those are the kind of cases we can handle in our office. We don't, you know, traditionally those are handled by an innocence organization outside of a prosecutor's office. But DA Willis thinks it's important enough for us to look at those cases in-house. Obviously, DNA cases aren't as prevalent. We, we've done a bunch of those cases and we're, we're now looking at other kinds of actual innocence cases. So that's the one kind of case we handle. The other kind of case we handle involves sentencing. And we have changed- I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you for a sec, Ms. Maxwell, because we've got Wheeler on. Good morning, Wheeler. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I don't know what you did, whether you plugged in the computer or poured warm root beer on it, but it's working. 
All right. We just did the best we could, y'all. <laughs> thank you so much. Always appreciate what you guys do. All right. Thank you. Don't jostle the cords. All right. Are you Mr. Lucky? Yes, sir. Good. It's nice to meet you. Um, I don't know if you can see me. I'm on one of the little screens. I'm Judge McBurney. Um, I in, I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Okay. You may be doing a little better when we're done this morning. Um, I inherited Judge Arrington's docket. Judge Arrington was the judge to whom your case was assigned. Um, I've learned a little bit from your lawyer, Mr. Young, who you can see on the screen there about the history of the case. You went to trial, were convicted, and were sentenced to 25 years in custody as a recidivist. Um, and it's what we call a C recidivist, which means whatever jail term the judge gave you, um, you're gonna do all of it. Um, that's 25 years. Um, your case was brought to the district attorney's office's attention, new district attorney, and her team has concluded, I believe, although we're gonna hear from Ms. Maxwell in a moment, that the sentence was disproportionate. Um, not that you didn't do what you were charged with, the jury found you guilty of possessing heroin with the intent to distribute, but that the consequences of that crime weren't so severe that you should be serving 25 years of your life in custody with no possibility of parole. Um, so if you're ready to proceed, um, Mr. Lucky, I'm gonna ask Ms. Maxwell um, or Mr. Young, it doesn't matter which, it's a joint motion from them um, to get on the record what they wanna get on the record. Uh, and I'll certainly hear from you if there's anything you wanna add. And then um, I'll make an oral ruling. Um, if I grant this motion, I'll actually need to enter a new sentence that would reflect the recommendation of these two lawyers and these two sides. Uh, but I'll get that done in the next couple of days. What they previewed with me is that this isn't something that's going to result in you getting out tomorrow. So there's not that kind of rush, but that it would certainly reduce the amount of time remaining on the custodial part of your sentence. Hopefully none of that is news to you. Is that what you thought we were doing today? Yes, sir. Great. So Ms. Maxwell, let me know, please, whether you're going to be doing the talking for the most part or Mr. Young, I'll certainly give both sides a chance to be heard. Well, I'm suffering from a little um, laryngitis. So I'm going to let Mr. Young do the majority of the, the heavy lifting. Thank All you. right, Mr. Young. And you've shared some of it with me. We're on the record now, but you're welcome to streamline it a bit um, in, unless there's something you think you need to be adding. Um, I, I'll, I'll streamline it, Your Honor. I would like to hit the, the, the sentencing portion on the record just to make sure that we're all clear on it. Um, Your Honor, I indicated this to the court prior to us going on the record, but Mr. Lucky um, received a sentence uh, subsequent to trial and a guilty verdict of uh, 30 to serve 25 in custody under 1710-7C. Um, Your Honor, Ms. Maxwell and I, uh, working together on Mr. Lucky's case, um, have agreed that the state would withdraw its recidivist notice in this case. Uh, Your Honor, I believe Ms. Maxwell sent that to Ms. Hansberry uh, maybe about 45 uh, minutes ago. And uh, at around the same time, I sent the court a proposed order um, prepared by me, approved by uh, Ms. Maxwell. And uh, those should be in the, in the court's um, possession, uh, hopefully soon. Your Honor, what we're requesting in this case um, is effectively mercy. Judge, uh, Mr. Lucky received, again, a sentence of, sir, of 25 years to serve. Our proposed new sentence uh, would be 30 serve 25, uh, excuse me, 30 serve 20. And um, that would see Mr. Lucky, I believe, uh, eligible for a halfway house upon the court um, entering the new sentence. Uh, judge, the halfway house or transitional facility, whatever term we want to use, would help Mr. Lucky um, in the last process of his um, uh, time in Georgia Department of Corrections custody um, with the things that I, I believe would set Mr. Lucky up for uh, more success than, than if he were to walk out today. Um, Your Honor, Mr. Lucky is 58 years old. When he first was arrested for this case, he was 39 years old um, back in 2004. Uh, Judge, the state of Mr. Lucky at this point, while he is mentally uh, 
all there and very capable. Unfortunately, his physical health has been declining considerably in the past couple years. And um, Judge, again, this is a motion of mercy at the end of the day. Um, I would be happy to talk about Mr. Lucky and his family and, and what he has had going on while he's been in custody. But ultimately, Your Honor, uh, Mr. Lucky was accused of and convicted of being in the possession of 13 separate baggies of heroin. That was the, the accusation and what was uh, accused in the throughout the, the trial, Your Honor. The weight was not necessarily, I believe, specified throughout the transcript that much. The emphasis on the with intent to distribute was the um, packaging, the 13 baggies uh, of heroin. Your Honor, um, Mr. Lucky at the time of his arrest and at the time of the trial in this case was unfortunately in the throes of addiction. And uh, a story that I'm sure the court has heard countless times before Mr. Lucky was um, taking actions to feed the addiction and um, unfortunately, that is what landed him in the position that resulted in him facing the next 25 years of his life in custody. Um, Your Honor, I believe the selection of the year of 20 years um, was ultimately to target that transitional facility goal. Um, I've been in contact with Mr. Lucky's counselor uh, at Wheeler, um, and uh, we're hoping that once assuming Mr. Lucky were to be resentenced by your honor, um, that, that once that sentence is, is set in stone, um, that I would send that over to the counselor ASAP, as well as the general counsel for Georgia Department of Corrections, in the hopes that we could see that next step taken here in the next few months. Um, your honor, I, I believe right before we went on the record, Ms. Maxwell was speaking about the conviction integrity unit a little bit. And um, I, just to wrap up that thought for 30 seconds, Your Honor, uh, Ms. Maxwell and I have done uh, maybe about 20 of these throughout Fulton County. Um, Your Honor, they, they, they have spanned from uh, actual innocence cases to, I, I would say the majority of them are, are um, sentence modifications or, as Ms. Maxwell put them, uh, uh, correcting maybe previously over sentenced cases. Judge, this went to trial in front of in front of Judge Manis back in 2005. And um, back in 2005, while uh, I was not a practicing attorney yet, um, I think it's well documented that- Were you in third grade or fourth grade in 2005? Would your honor like me to answer that question? No, I don't. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Your Honor, uh, I, I believe that I can say with confidence that back in 2005, uh, this case, this type of charge and this type of sentence was more prevalent and it was um, more of the going rate than uh, than surely what we what we how we view drug addiction now and how we handle these types of cases. And I believe that that is part of the sentencing reform um posture that the conviction integrity unit is taking with these types of cases. Um, Your Honor, while Mr. Lucky was uh, convicted as a recidivist, his history is almost entirely drug history. Uh, there's no violent history and anything that might not be a direct drug charge, I believe is a charge that could be tied back to drug addiction. Um, Mr. Lucky has spent the last 18 and a half years of his life overcoming that uh, in Georgia Department of Corrections custody, but most certainly at 58 years old, Mr. Lucky is a very different man than when he entered uh, custody back in 2005. Got it. Um, Ms. Maxwell, a couple um, due diligence questions for you. Um, uh, did um, you make any inquiry to see how Mr. Lucky has been doing in custody um, uh, in terms of whether he's had write-ups or sanctions or anything like that? Did, Your Honor. And um, I have to tell Mr. Lucky, I'm incredibly impressed with you. Uh, he is one of maybe five people I've looked at through the whole thing, uh, through every case. And I've had 600 cases that we've looked at who has absolutely no disciplinary record. And okay. he has done some really important programming, including substance abuse programming. 
And, uh, and is your review of his criminal history similar to Mr. Young's? I'm, I'm looking in the docket and there is a recidivist notice, but all it says is all convictions on GCIC and it's not attached. So I just want to make sure we're not missing um, something that I ought to factor in, in in thinking about how to handle this. Now, he has three prior convictions, um, one in 1988, which was a possession of cocaine with intent. Um, one was 1991, which is another possession of cocaine. And then the third was a, a 1997 um, auto theft. Okay, this is definitely a three strikes you're out um, approach. Okay, um, that's, that's very helpful. Is the view, Ms. Maxwell or Mr. Young, that the balance of the sentence would be probated? I haven't heard what, I appreciate the request is 30 to serve 20, but I didn't hear suspended, probated, what, what is the? The balance to be probated. Probated, okay, great. Um, I will do that. Mr. Lucky, were you on bond for your trial or were you already in custody? I was on bond. Okay, so you went into custody in April of 2005 when you were convicted? Yes, sir. Okay, that makes the math easier. And where is home for you when you initially home will be in a transitional living situation, but when you complete that, where will home be? Jonesboro, Georgia. Okay. And you still have family there? Right, I have a, a fiance. And, um, how, how long has she been waiting on you as a fiance? The whole 18 and a half years. Wow. All right. You found, you found a good partner. Um, Mr. Lucky, is there anything you want to add in connection with what I've heard from your lawyer and from the prosecutor? I would like to ask your honor to accept this um, new sentence. And you're looking at a total different person from April the 6th of 2005, you know, and um, I have great plans for what I want to do with my life when I get out. And I have 26 grandkids waiting on me. <laughs> Well, there's one plan for you is <laughs> visiting each of those grandkids. That's the first couple years that you've got there. Mr. Lucky, um, I will be granting the motion. Um, it is um, unfortunate that at the time um, we didn't take a more holistic approach to how we work through situations like yours. I, I'm not critical of the actors who were involved. Um, I'm confident that the state recommended a sentence. In fact, I see there's a notice that the state was going to potentially seek a life sentence against you um, because of this conviction. And um, at that time, um, the public was very concerned about the impact of drug dealing on the community and the crime that flows from that. And heroin in particular was viewed as particularly dangerous. And that's not me demonizing you or, or that situation. Um, but I think we have learned a lot about how those kinds of sentences uh, lock away folks who actually have a whole lot more to them than just those incidents. Um, and I am glad that you have survived your sentence because that's not always what we see um, and that you feel like, and, and we'll know that more when you're released, that you are going to come out of this in a, an improved situation. Not that it was great to spend 18 plus years of your life in the Department of Corrections, but that you are changed in a way that you're going to embrace your family and your remaining years in a much more productive way than maybe the years leading up to your conviction. Um, I wish you the best. I will do this paperwork either today or this weekend. Um, it will get filed and then um, pushed down to the Department of Corrections. Um, you ought to be checking in with folks there um, in the next week or so if they don't have paperwork. Um, reach out to Mr. Young. Um, he is your channel of communication and he can provide the paperwork. It will be um, made available to him as well so that the Department of Corrections can recalculate everything. The biggest piece isn't so much the year reduction, it's the withdrawal of the recidivist notice because that makes you immediately eligible for parole and you are eminently parolable given your relatively limited and entirely nonviolent and very old criminal history. So um, I will be sure to make that part of the final disposition. Ms. Maxwell, anything else from the state? No, Your Honor, thank you. Mr. Young? Uh, Your Honor, only that um, attorney Max Shart um, is the attorney who initiated this case with the conviction integrity unit before he 
um, went private with our office. And I think that he would be quite upset if he did not get some type of recognition in this hearing, Judge. A shout out for Sharp. All right. Well, he can continue to languish in the YSL case. Um, <laughs> and uh, I will thank him the next time I see him. This is real important work that you guys do. Um, and um, it's phenomenal that we're in the 20s now. Um, again, each one is a life changer. Um, and uh, I appreciate uh, that you all are looking at this because uh, Mr. Lucky very easily becomes a man forgotten. Um, and he serves his time and query whether um, the world is a better place because um, he spent 25 years in prison at the taxpayer's expense, no less. Um, so there are lots of ways about thinking about how this is a suboptimal outcome to what was the problem back then? Now, no one's celebrating who you were back then, um, Mr. Lucky, but I think we're all excited about who you're ready to be um, when uh, you are out and about again. Any questions, Mr. Lucky? No, sir. Okay, I'll take care of that paperwork. Ms. Willis, thank you for doing whatever you did behind the scenes to reconnect us with Wheeler. And thank you, uh, ma'am, at Wheeler for connecting Mr. Lucky to us. You're welcome, All right, Mr. Lucky, you're good to go. All right, y'all have a nice day. You too. Thank you, May we be excused? Yes, you are both free to go. Get well, Ms. Maxwell. Thank you, Your Honor. Let's pivot to Mr. George. Uh, Mr. Richardson, if you and your client want to come on up to council table and good morning, Ms. Clark. Good morning, Your Honor. Do you need the style of the case? You got it? Great. Okay. Let me know, Ms. Clark, when you are ready. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Um, but I was asked to make sure um, it was more Mr. Abate yesterday that you speak into the microphone for folks who may be, excuse me, consuming this remotely. Okay. Ready, Ron. Okay. Uh, Mr. George and Mr. Richardson, if you'd come up to the podium, please. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. We're going to get on the record in 23 SC 187365. Mr. Jo Mr. George is here with his lawyer, Mr. Richardson. And we have Ms. Clark on behalf of the state. Mr. George, um, Mr. Richardson has told me that you are prepared to enter a plea in your case. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. The way that's going to work is that in just a moment, Ms. Clark will put you under oath. Okay. Once you're under oath, you'll need to answer all her questions and a few from me truthfully and completely. Uh, it is important that if at any point during the conversation that the four of us are having, you're confused by something or not following what's going on, you let Mr. Richardson or me know because I need to make a finding at the end that you understood what we talked about. There shouldn't be any surprises, but you never know when someone's going to say something like, wait, I, I didn't think that's what was happening. Um, will you let me know if we need to pause so you can either speak with your lawyer or ask me the question? Yes, sir. Great. Ms. Clark, when you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that any evidence or testimony that you shall give in the matter currently pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury? Yes, ma'am. You can put your hand down. Please state and spell your correct legal name. First name, James, J-A-M-E-S. Last name, George, G-E-O-R-G-E. -E. Are you at this time taking or under the influence of any medicine, drugs, or alcohol? No, ma'am. Is there a medication that you normally take that you have not taken or been given today? No, ma'am. How old are you? 32 years. What's the highest level of education or the last grade you completed? I have my GED. Are you able to read, write, and understand the English language? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. 
Do you understand that you've been charged with the following offenses under indictment number 2023SC187365? 20, count one, possession of marijuana with intent to distribute. Count two, terroristic threats. Count three, possession of firearms and commission of certain felonies. And count four, possession of firearm by convicted felon. Yes, ma'am. Do you understand that you have the right to plead either guilty or not guilty to these charges? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand that if you plead not guilty or remain silent, then the state is required to prove the charges against you at a jury trial? Yes, ma'am. Have you had an opportunity to review your indictment with your attorney? Yes, ma'am. And did you understand the indictment as explained to you by your attorney? Yes, ma'am. Have you had enough time to speak with your lawyer about all of the charges in the indictment against you, including the facts and circumstances relating to these charges? Yes, ma'am. Are you satisfied with your lawyer services? Yes, ma'am. Attorney Richardson, do you waive a formal reading of the indictment? Yes, we yes, we do. Do you waive any defects in the indictment for purposes of this plea? Yes. Has your attorney advised you of the minimum and maximum sentence for each charge to which you're pleading guilty today? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The state will provide those um, for the record. Um, count one, possession of marijuana with intent to distribute. The minimum is one year. The maximum is 10 years in prison. Uh, count two, terroristic threats. The minimum is one year. The max is five years in prison. Count three, possession of firearm during commission of certain felonies. The uh, charge will be uh, five years consecutive to the underlying felony. And count four, possession of firearm by convicted felon. The minimum is one year, the maximum is 10 years. Do you understand that you're entering a negotiated plea of guilty, which means that the state and defense will recommend the following sentence to the court? For count one, possession of marijuana with intent to distribute, state's recommendation is um, 10 years, uh, 47 days to serve. The defendant will be uh, commuted to time served because he's already served from 10-4-2020 to 11-19-2020. Three years to serve on house arrest. That time is commuted to time. He is already worn an ankle monitor. Defendant will be released from wearing an ankle monitor. Remainder of the sentence is probated with a behavioral incentive date of three years from the final disposition of this case. Defendant forfeits all weapons, monies, and other property confiscated at the time of arrest. Defendant is subject to the following special conditions, an anger management course within six months of the final disposition of this case. An online course is permitted, but it must be a minimum of two hours. Stay away from the incident location. No contact with the victim in this case. No drugs unless prescribed and no alcohol. Defendant is prohibited from associating with known gang members. Defendant is prohibited from displaying guns, replicas of guns, including water guns on any social media account. Defendant must remain gainfully employed while he is on probation. Is that, uh, and that is for count one, those special conditions apply to all of the other counts, terroristic threats. The state's recommendation on that would be one year of probation to run concurrent with count one. Uh, count three, possession of firearms during commission of certain felonies. The state's recommendation is five years suspended. And count four, possession of firearm by convicted felon. State's recommendation um, on that one is five years probation to run concurrent with count one. Is that your understanding of the terms? No, no, okay. that's not. It's my understanding the gun charges were going to be no pros because the gun belonged to another individual. And we it's my understanding based on our email that he was going to be pleading guilty today to count one, which is the marijuana offense. Okay. And the other counts wouldn't be no pros. Okay. You don't have to cave in, but I just want to make sure, um, is that what, why don't you check your notes? So okay. well, I've, got the, yeah. I've got the email here. I, I'm not doubting you, Mr. Richardson. I, I know you're not, and I'm not uh, doubting her either because she's well, always been yeah. professional. Let, let me, uh, yeah, because I know that you and uh, ADA um, people had yeah. had something. Uh, so let me, yeah, I, I, that's fine. Okay. okay, all right. So really everything you said still applies uh, in terms of the, I'm going to have to dissect it a little bit, but the time served and the house arrest and all that, because right. that was all connected with count one. The 
disconnect, which we're going to reconnect on the record in just a moment, is that um, Mr. Richardson and his client were under the impression that it was a plea to count one only, two through four being null prost, aka dismissed. You were building the same sentence, um, but it was pleased to those other counts. It's not insignificant to plead to those other counts. And so I just want to make sure we've got an understanding here, because while it can be non-negotiated as to what the sentence is, it can't be non-negotiated as to which counts of conviction there are. Mr. George needs to plead guilty to some, none, or all. If it's none, go to trial. If it's some, then we're done. So um, I don't know if you need to look. I know you're coming in late in the sense that other lawyers have tinkered with this case before you had it. Oh, Your Honor, uh, it's fine. I, I'm, it's fine. Okay. So, so why don't you state for the record from the state's perspective then to which of the counts you're expecting Mr. George to enter a plea? Um, the state is going to be expecting uh, the defendant to enter a plea to count one of the indictment. The state will null cross counts two, three, and four of the indictment. Is that your understanding? Yes, ma'am. So now it's my turn. Um, uh, I'm trying to figure out how I would pronounce sentence if I mirrored what you said. 47 days to serve, but he gets credit for that because he's done 47 days. Then three years of house arrest, but um, you're saying those have already happened because crazily Mr. George has had to wear an ankle monitor for three years. Um, you still got it on? Oh, yes, I have. It. You must have a funny tan line. <laughs> That's a long time. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for keeping it charged. Um, so really, it's a little less than seven years of probation is what the recommendation is. Because that's what would be left. Um, if there's three years of this house arrest that he's uh, being reduced to time served or, or whatnot in the 47 days, 10 minus three years plus 47 days is a little less than seven years probation. And, and we were more concerned and excited about the bid date. So, okay. so, so, you know, that's, that's not a problem. Uh, we had agreed upon a, uh, uh, upon a bid date of three years. And uh, that was, that was our main concern is getting a, a three year bid date. Okay. Got it. All right. You can keep going. Thank you. Okay. Do you understand that the court is not required to accept the state's recommended sentence? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand that the court has the right to sentence you to the maximum possible sentence on each charge? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand that as there are multiple charges to which you're pleading guilty today, the court also has the right to run those sent uh, sentences consecutively, meaning one after the other? Except here, I know okay. that would fit previously, but now it's just one charge. So nothing can be consecutive. Just one count. I'm going to do what I do after I hear from everyone. Thank you. Got it? Okay. Are you currently on probation or parole? No, ma'am. Do you understand that if you're on probation, you must follow all the special conditions of your probation? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand that if you fail to follow all the special conditions of your probation, then you will be subject to revocation of that probation for the balance of your sentence? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand that you are not allowed to possess or use a firearm while on probation? Yes, ma'am. Are you a United States citizen? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand that by entering a plea of guilty today, you're waiving all defenses, including any mental health defenses? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand that by pleading guilty, you're giving up the following rights, the right to a trial by jury, the right to remain silent, the right to confront witnesses against you, the right to subpoena witnesses on your behalf, the right to testify or offer other evidence, the right to the assistance of counsel, the right to the presumption of innocence, the right not to incriminate yourself, and the right to appeal if convicted of these charges at a trial? Yes, ma'am. Is it your decision to waive these rights, which means not to use them, and to enter a guilty plea today? Yes, ma'am. Has anyone forced, threatened, coerced, or promised you anything to get you to enter this guilty plea? No, ma'am. Is it your decision to enter a guilty plea because you are in fact guilty? Yes, ma'am. As to indictment number 23SC187365, how do you plead to the one count of possession of marijuana with intent to distribute? Guilty. Is this guilty plea freely and voluntarily given with full knowledge of the charges against you? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand that you only have a limited right to appeal this guilty plea conviction? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand that if you wish to file a direct appeal, you must do so within 30 days from today's date? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand that if you wish to challenge 
the voluntariness of your guilty plea, you must do so by filing what is called a habeas corpus petition. Yes, ma'am. You understand that for a felony charge, you have only four years from today's date to file that petition. Yes, ma'am. At this time, the state will provide a factual basis to this court for the felony plea in this case. If this matter would have went to trial, the state would have been able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that on October 3rd, 2020, at the incident location of Atlantis Restaurant and Lounge located at 1937 Piedmont Circle Northeast and at a nearby BP gas station located at 1925 Monroe Drive Northeast. Both addresses are located in Buckhead, Atlanta, Georgia, 30324, which are both in Fulton County. The victim, Walter Wilkins, was working as a security guard at Atlantis that evening when an argument broke out between two gangs. The security guards removed the individuals from the club and instructed them to leave the property. The defendant, James George, a convicted felon, asked the valet to retrieve his vehicle. Once inside his vehicle, however, Defendant George refused to leave the property. Wilkins again asked George to leave and the, the defendant responded by threatening to spray him up and, pray, and spray up the club, then reached between the seats as if for, for a weapon. Victim Wilkins reached for his sidearm and asked Defendant George if he had a weapon. Defendant George stated that he did. Wilkins said he was going to call police and George said he just did 10 years in prison and wasn't afraid to go back. Wilkins then, at, then watched as defendant George drove off the property and across the street to the BP gas station where he parked and went inside. Officers responded to the scene, Mirandized and questioned defendant George who denied that it was him and then searched his vehicle incident to arrest locating a black Glock firearm in the space between the driver and passenger seats. Inside a black bag in the vehicle, officers located a large amount of a green leafy substance. The substance was later transported to the GBI lab where it was analyzed and tested positive for marijuana, weighing over 16.25 ounces, just over a pound. Officers also located a digital scale in the vehicle of the type often used to distribute illegal substances. Defendant George is a convicted felon having served 10 years in prison for armed robbery and possession of a weapon during a felony. He was convicted for these offenses on September 21st, 2009 in Rockdale County and sentenced to 10 years imprisonment followed by five years probation. He was on probation at the time that this incident occurred. Your Honor, in, in this case, the state um, uh, was able to negotiate with defense counsel. Um, the uh, attorney Richardson had negotiated previously with ADA Peoples. And then I had asked for additional mitigation information, letters of recommendation, I wanted to see letters of recommendation from his employer. Um, he also provided additional letters of recommendation and other things, family pictures to show that he is a father of a child. Um, and based on all of that information, it, it indicates that the defendant, since he has gotten um, in trouble this time, has looked to uh, turn his life around. And for that, um, the state felt comfortable in offering the behavioral incentive date and also to... Um, make the negotiation that we did. Okay, thank you for that. Good morning, Ms. smith Man. Can you share with me the criminal history information you have on Mr. George? Yes, good morning, Your Honor. Four prior arrests, not including the case before you this morning, last arrest being on 6-2023, probation violation, Rockdale County Sheriff's Office, case is currently open according to GCIC. 5, 2023, Henry County Sheriff's Office, aggravated assault and criminal trespass, case indicted July, 2023. 11, 2020, probation violation for possession of a firearm during commit armed robbery, open your honor. 10, 2008, Rockdale County Sheriff's Office, possession of firearm or knife during commission of attempt to commit certain felonies. Convicted 9-20-09, armed robbery. Convicted 9-20-09, nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. We don't have anyone from probation on, um, so I'm going to need to rely on you, Mr. Richardson, a couple things, and then anything else you want to cover. 
what is the status of the probation in Rockdale, by which I mean, is this conviction something that could result in a revocation? Um, and if so, I just want to make sure Mr. George understands that while he may leave court today, Rockdale could swear out a warrant um, if there hasn't already been a revocation in connection with this arrest. And then number two, as much as you're comfortable telling me about, there's a, he's got an open aggravated assault indictment. And here we're saying, hey, he's a changed guy. And, and um, it's from a, a recent arrest. Um, so understandably, that gives me pause. And, 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 and I, I entirely understand the, the court's concern and I respect this honorable court's uh, position. I will, I will also represent to you as an officer of the court that I have represented uh, this young man with regards to all of his, his, his unfortunate criminal problems since he had to serve, after serving 10 years in prison uh, since the age of, of, of 16 or 17. But once he was released from prison, uh, he, he stayed with his mother who's in the courtroom. And, I, and I'd like this honorable court to listen or hear from the mother because I, I don't think anybody can say it any better than mama. So I, I'd like for this honorable court to hear from mama I will tell you with regards to the Rockdale case, I handle that case. That case has been closed with regards to the Henry County. Meaning the probation. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that case has been closed with regards to the aggravated assault in Henry County. It is pending. It's still open. There is a, a, a an immunity argument that's pending before Judge uh, uh, Palmer out there. And, the, and we had a preliminary hearing and the victim who is the, his, his child's mother showed up for the hearing and said that she, it, it, she, it was an emotional situation. She got upset. I've got a transcript of her testimony indicating that she does not want to move forward with the charges. She, she blew it out of proportion with the police because she was pissed off at him and she wanted him arrested. But that case is going to get dismissed. I'm confident it's going to get dismissed at an immunity uh, at, a, at an immunity hearing. But. but but the Henry County case then is a domestic situation. It's not an additional alleged gang situation. That's, that that's with the baby's mama. Okay. And then there was a dispute over getting the child. There was a dispute over child support, and before we know it, it, it blew out of proportion. She called the police. He got arrested. She went to the police department the next day and said, "You know, I, I made a mistake." But then when she came to the court, she testified under oath at the preliminary hearing that she, in fact, had misrepresented information to the police. I've got I've got that on a transcript with her testimony under oath. So I'm confident that the case in Henry County is going to be positively disposed of in his favor. OK. All right. If you could hear from the mom, I truly appreciate it. Judge. Sure, ma'am. If you'd come up and stand by the deputy. Please, please raise your right hand. Oh, in, in, if, in, unless um, Ms. Clark's going to be asking her questions, you don't need to swear her in. Um, so if you're just going to be basically serving as a character witness for your son, um, we're good. If you just state your name so that we can get that into the transcript, um, then I'd like to hear what you have to say. Yes, sir. It's Yolanda, Y-O-L-A-N-D-A, Barron, B-A-R-O-N. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Your Honor, for allowing me to uh, speak for you. Um, I am also also in the law. I'm a major with the Cap County Police Department. So it's Major Barron. Yes, yes, I'm just kidding. But yes, sir, um, I've been with the Cap for 21 years. So I'm sure you, each of you can understand that this is definitely not where or the, um, the journey that I would have wanted my child's life to um, have taken. Um, I have fought for the law um, and the integrity of the system that um, I have stood for for 21 years. But our children, they sometimes make their own way. Um, I will never say that my child is perfect, neither am I. But what I will say is that um, he really has changed his self around. Um, as the attorney stated, and as the record shows, he was um, sentenced to 10 years at the age of 17. And um, the type of parent that I am, I'm a mother, but I'm an active mother, concerned, dedicated mother, and I'm a mother that believes in practicing parental guidance. So when he was sentenced, I was sentenced to for 10 years. And 
One of the problems with James is that, you know, getting out after 10 years, he found like a lot that in the, you know, get involved with recidivism is they try and make up that time. So at 17, getting out the age of 27, trying to make up for what he, you know, missed out on, not to make excuses, but this is why we are here where we are. And for James, some people that take a second chance, but James is taking this third chance. Um, since really saying that the system is not playing with him. That is why he has really truly turned his life around. I really would say it even when attorney Richardson would call me, I'm like, well, he's right here. You want to talk to him? You know, because he really, and I think also having a daughter that did something to him um, as <coughs> 11 month old, that did something to him as well, realizing that he has done something that can now cause him to not be in his child's life. And so I'm pleading the court He's pleading according to him, though he hasn't said anything, but he truly, truly is trying to do better. One of the things that you know, I try and press upon him, you made some mistake that has confined you, but it don't need to define you. And that is something that he is now really saying. He's working, um, since working, he done, um, actually done got two promotions since um, getting um, the job that he works on. Um, he is doing really, really good. Um, he actually has bran he's branching off within that job. Also, now they've got his own company where he has mastered the skill with painting. And so now he has his own company where any type of jobs he's able to do, he's doing those. So he is really, really has turned himself around. You know, I um, spoke at the probation, not the probation, but his um, um, bond hearing. The judge allowed me to speak, and um, she gave me, she asked me to give, give her her word that he would honor the stipulations that she had put in place on his house arrest. Now, yeah, at the end of the day, I know I gave my word, but it was more about me as a parent. And seeing me back in this situation, I could not allow it to happen. Was the house arrest such that Mr. George was living with you? Yeah, he's been living with Okay. Yes, sir. And, and Mr. Mr. Um, George to tell you, yeah, there was times I called, okay, you done got off the 285 traffic, got 20, you should be here in 47 minutes and three seconds. And you believe if he did not show up in 43 minutes, three seconds, he would get another call from him. So he, and, and I want to take away from him because I think there's power behind a made up mind to where he made up his mind that he wanted to do right. So I don't want to take away from him the things he's been doing to show that he can be trusted, the things he's been doing to show that he is now on the right journey. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for being there for Mr. George. Mr. George, anything you want to say? I just want to say uh, thank you, Your Honor. I haven't done anything yet. <laughs> I just want to thank you. Yeah, don't, don't get ahead of things. You can understand why I'm a little concerned. Um, you're out of jail, prison after 10 years, and in just a few months, um, you get caught. Now, this is three years ago, but pretty soon after you got out, you're rolling in a car with a gun and a fair amount of marijuana in it, and I don't, you don't need to justify it or anything like that. Doesn't matter if it was your gun or not. Doesn't matter if it was your marijuana or not. That was the car you were rolling in, and you should have viewed that as radioactive because folks are going to have eyes on you after you get out after an armed robbery. And it's just real hard, and your mom said it just right, it's hard to not be defined in the system by something like a 10-year sentence for armed robbery. Because the thing that comes to mind is this is a guy who does dangerous things with guns. And then you get arrested pretty soon after you get out with a gun in the mix. Um, you need to be more careful than most folks to not be in that kind of situation. That may make life less interesting, um, but that will make life more fulfilling for you um, because it's harder for you to catch a break than if Mr. Richardson's client had gone to jail for a burglary. And I'm like, yeah, this is something different. And But you had just gotten out for a pretty serious crime of violence and you paid a steep price for it. And um, the whole theme that I'm hearing and that I think I'm accepting, because again, this was three years ago, that you have changed and learned um, from your time in prison um, that would not have rung true if this case had not taken three years to indict. Um, maybe there's a benefit that you've been lugging that ankle monitor around for three years because you've shown us, apart from 
whatever happened with you and the mother of your child, that um, you can do things a little differently now. And you are doing things a little bit differently. But um, we would have had a very different conversation if the state had promptly indicted you. And we were talking about this in early 2021, because you would have been kind of fresh from prison. And then what? This happened? Um, so uh, you just, you need to be careful. Um, it, it needn't define you, um, but if you keep getting in trouble, it, it will define you. Tell me where you're working. Uh, Barron's Enterprise. So um, that sounds like, is it your mom's company? Because your name is George and hers is Barron, or is that? It's a uh, family company. Family uh, company. Yes, my uh, dad has his own uh, contract in business. Okay. And then you're developing a side gig of doing your own painting? Yes, sir. Okay. And painting as in, I need this wall yeah. painted gray, as opposed to, here's a portrait of President uh, yes, sir. Biden. Yes, sir. Okay. Got it. Um, and you have a daughter? Yes, sir. Her name? Jamis. And does she stay primarily with you or her mom or back and forth? Yeah, her mother, back and forth. And where does she live? Um, Henry County. Okay. Oh, hence the Henry County charge. But you live in DeKalb, or you're, where, I don't know where your mom's home is. Yeah, Co uh, Covington. Okay. All right. Um, how are things today with you and your child's mother? Or are you not allowed to be around her because of a bond condition? It's, it's, it's going pretty good. We, um, we've been doing pretty good with her dropping the baby off and picking up. Okay. How often do you see your child? Every weekend. Okay. Anything else you want to share with me? No, sir. All right. Well, Mr. George, um, I find there is a factual basis for your plea, We're pleading just to the marijuana part, so we don't need to get into whose gun it was or anything like that. Um, I also find that your plea was knowing and voluntary. Voluntary means no one's forcing you to do this. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. You've decided after consulting with your lawyer and your mom and anyone else, this is how you want to go forward is with a plea. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And knowing means you've understood the things we've talked about. Do you have any questions about anything Ms. Clark said, Mr. Richardson said, or I said? No, sir. All right. Then I'll accept your plea. Um, Ms. Clark, is it all right if someone on my staff electronically signs the indictment for you? Yes, Your Honor. Can we sign for you, Mr. Richardson? Yes, you can, Your Honor. And Mr. George, um, way back when we'd hand all these papers around and people would sign them, but now we're trying to just use electronic signatures. Can we affix your signature as a plea to count one, counts two, three, and four being dismissed in your indictment? Yes, sir. Okay. So um, I know it was a while ago. Was there any recent outreach to Walter Wilkins? That would be the security guard who would have felt threatened. I know that count isn't going forward, but he's named in the case as a victim. Um, any info from him that you have or that is in a case file? Uh, the only thing we have is that he didn't really want to be involved in the process. <laughs> okay, security guards usually don't. All right, thank you. Mr. George, um, we're going forward with just one count. Um, what I'm gonna do in um, this case for that one count is sentence you to six years to serve one month with the balance probated. You've already served more than a month, so you're not going back into custody. Uh, you served that month three years ago. Um, I appreciate that you've been not quite on house arrest because you've been able to work um, and apparently get down into Henry County and get in a little trouble there. Um, but you'll get your ankle monitor off just as soon as you can connect with a and They'll want it back, and once you show them your sentence, they'll, they'll remove it. Um, that can come off. Um, you'll forfeit the gun that was seized. Um, just means you don't go try to get it. Um, that'll be destroyed if it hasn't already been destroyed. Um, uh, I'm going to have you um, complete what's called a family violence intervention program, and I'm intervening here a little bit with the Henry County case. That may well get dismissed. Uh, you've got a great lawyer who may be able to make that happen, but clearly, having a kid um, and, and interacting with your child's um, other parent um, is emotionally complicated. And you completing a family violence intervention program will equip you with tools to make sure whatever happened happens in a different way. Whether it was an aggravated assault or not, it sounds like things got pretty heated. I don't want you to comment it on it at all. This is an open case in another jurisdiction. But this family violence intervention program will help a young father. 
um, be a better father and maybe someday a husband or intimate partner with someone who's in your life. Uh, it will only help. Um, and it will hopefully help you avoid charges like the ones you picked up in Henry County. Because again, for a little while, that past that armed robbery is going to define you, at least within the narrow world of the criminal justice system. 10 years is a long time. Um, you'll need to stay any reason. I don't know that Atlantis still exists. I'm try, I was trying to figure out where the BP station was and all that. Don't you don't know? It's off Cheshire Bridge. Yeah. The Cheshire Bridge area. Yeah. Um, do you come to Fulton County much other than for fun court dates? No, I don't come much. Okay. All right. Um, so what I'll do is have as a condition of your probation that you stay out of the Cheshire Bridge Monroe corridor. You can come to Atlanta, um, but just stay away from there. Um, and you should know this already. You cannot be around guns. Your armed robbery conviction, convicted felon, you can't have one in your house. It's a little complicated if you're staying with your mom. She's a major with the DeKalb Police Department. But it is a violation of the law for you to be in a household that has a firearm in it because you have access to that. Obviously, you can't have one on you. You shouldn't be driving a car where there's one in the center console. Um, but uh, that's something that will fall onto you. If you get pulled over, it's your friend's car, maybe it's his gun, but you're driving it, that gun's going to get associated with you and they're toxic for you um, as a convicted felon. So just you, you're going to have to work with your mom on that. It won't be a condition of your sentence that you reside with your mother. Um, it may be you're ready to fly free a little bit. It may be that staying with your mom is a safe place. Um, and you get some good supervision, um, but that's not a condition of your sentence. So you'll be able to work out um, where it is you stay. I will set a behavioral incentive date of three years from now, which would be um, the 10th of October of 2026, uh, of November, 10th of November of 2026. If during those three years, you've had no issues on probation, I mean, no arrests, anything like that, then probation can close your case out. You'll be 35 by then. Your kid will be three and a half, almost four. Uh, you may have another one. Hopefully by then you will have um, solidified your new you um, and not the old you. Um, and uh, we don't need probation looking over your shoulder if that's the case. But I agree with um, um, the two lawyers that we ought to have that supervision in place for a little bit. Um, and if there's an issue, it'll come back to me. Um, and I'll remember what your mom said, that you deserved a third chance. She's not going to be able to ask for a fourth chance. So commit to her, commit to your daughter. Um, you're going to be a painter and whatever else you want to be, um, a doctor, wherever you choose to go. It just needs to be a hard turn away from what got you that armed robbery conviction and whatever the heck you were doing at Atlantis and, and that situation. Got it? Questions? No, sir. Um, Mr. Richardson, uh, anything? Nothing else, Your Honor. I think you've heard uh, what we wanted the court to hear, and uh, we asked the court uh, to, uh, we, 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 we're appreciative of the sentence that this court's ready to impose. So the wrinkle is we don't have probation here. And so what's going to happen, Mr. Richardson, is I'm going to have probation reach out to you, and you'll need to, actually, if you could get, before you go, if you could leave um, Mr. George's phone number and address. Um, I'll make sure that gets to probation. And they're going to reach out to you, um, Mr. George. You're in DeKalb. And so... In Covington? No, in Covington, Your Honor. Yeah, but is that not in DeKalb County? No. It's no, in that's in Rockdale. Rockdale. Oh, okay. Um, so is my... my Newton County. Newton County. Yeah. Point is, it's not Fulton County. Um, I need your address and your phone number because you report to probation in the county in yes. which you live. Yes, she told me I would have to go back to my same probation office. Okay, don't know. Um, probation will decide that. Um, but if I can get from Mr. Richardson your contact information, then probation will contact you um, and they'll give you reporting instructions. Do not miss that first date because if you don't show up for that first date, they just fill out a warrant and that'll come to me and we'll go, oh, Mr. Richardson is going to make some more money off you. Um, so uh, connect with them and... Uh, then uh, you guys can move forward. Ms. Clark, anything else on behalf of Mr. George? Another number. No, you are. All right. Congratulations on your daughter, Mr. George. I just want to make sure oh. you have any other numbers? What's yeah. your number? Oh, my number is 777. Uh -huh. 777-7. 3247. 
Thank you, Miss Whoops. Don't break our air purifier. Uh, once you kicked it. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Oh, I need the address too. I'll write it down, but what is your address? Uh, 155. 155. I hope it's not a complicated address. 155. Middleton Drive, M I D D L E T O N. Middleton Drive. Drive, Covington. Georgia 30016. 30016. Newton County. Got it. Be safe. You too, sir. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Richardson. Everyone have a good day. Yep. How much time do we have, timekeeper? Uh, 15, 10 minutes. 10 minutes? I heard you say 15 first. <laughs> um, Ms. Feely, are you still here? If you don't mind coming up, um, and Ms. Clark, you can sit at uh, council table. Okay. Um, Ms. Feely is the senior public defender assigned to my courtroom, and I asked her to be here um, in case you all had questions for her. Ms. Clark is what we call the line prosecutor. She handles the majority of cases assigned to me. There's one in each courtroom, uh, but they're specialized units for murders, sex crimes, gang cases, and a couple other things, um, but something like this. Um, uh, where it's it's just drugs. It's not a giant drug trafficking organization. Ms. Clark handles that. I want to cover a couple things and I want to open it up to you all. First, um, with Mr. Um, Lucky, um, <laughs> that was emblematic of how things used to happen. Funny fact, Judge Dunaway, your host for the whole day, he was the prosecutor on that case. He asked for a life sentence. He filed the recidivist notice. If that case was in front of him today, he would be unhappy with a prosecutor seeking a life sentence because it's a different situation that we view these things differently. I hope you heard what Mr. Young said, that while Mr. Lucky had distribution quantity heroin on him, he was an addict. And so one of you, not necessarily in this group, but in the large group asked, like, hey, do you differentiate between um, folks who are in it just for the money and folks who are in the business to support their own habit? And it sounds like Mr. Lucky was in that latter category. You saw the outcome, 25 years to serve to the door for his fourth conviction. And four may seem a lot to you all who may have zero convictions, but um, that is just not a lot of convictions for some of the folks we deal with. And that, that was a legal, but very <laughs> substantial sentence. Um, and it's good that we have that unit um, doing what they're doing. Last thing, um, in Mr. George's case, we see a lot of these and it's, it's frustrating for victims. If there's a victim who's active in the case, it's frustrating for the judge, obviously for the defendant. What he did was three years ago. It's a little late to be fussing at him. Um, what if in the intervening three years, he did something else like get in trouble with the mother of his kid. Um, if he has had three good years, it's hard for a prosecutor to say, you need to go lock him up. Look what he did three years ago. Um, the DA's office is climbing a hill of all cases. And so this indictment is new. It's a 2023 indictment. So it's not a case I could do anything with until this year, but it is conduct from 2020. It hamstrings the DA. She can only do so much. So, oh, lock him up. He's got three years under his belt of being a good, he's a painter, works for the family business, a father. Um, justice delayed is justice denied for a defendant and for a victim. If, if, the facts of this case were he actually had pulled a gun on the security guard and held it to his temple saying, I'm going to spray you up right here. Who knows what that person has been going through. But three years later, I don't want to plug in. This is how serious you take my case. So that's frustrating. Um, we are doing what we can to move those cases faster. But there is unfortunately a rash of those. I'm done. Do you all have questions for practitioners or me based on what you saw or anything else? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Lucky, during his time in prison, was there an effort to have him be a working person again? Because the question wasn't asked of him, what is he going to do to support himself uh, when he gets out? And So there are um, vocational programs that the uh, Department of Corrections offers. I, I, I didn't, there's a lot I wanted to ask Mr. Lucky, um, but I wanted to be respectful of everyone's time here. I wanted you to see a second event. And his answers weren't going to change what I was going to do. The key answer was hearing that he had not been trouble while he was in custody. It was the reverse. And you heard Ms. Maxwell say he's been a model. We could have 
dive deep into that. I, I um, have been helping out with the uh, chaplain or I've learned how to do HVAC work or who, who knows what. Um, I'm interested in, in what he'd be doing when he gets out. It sounds like step one will be meet each of the 26 grandkids. The opportunities are there. Um, I don't want to paint it like you're in college, but there are a number of skill sets you can acquire legitimately <laughs> um, while you are um, in the Department of Corrections that could you set you in a better stead when you're released. But of course, you need to be connected with those jobs and it needs to be an employer who's willing to hire someone who's been in prison for 20 years. Or, I mean, Mr. George has his job because it's a family business. If he were to apply at Home Depot, and it's not a knock on Home Depot, if he apply with me, like, yeah, no, I'm good. I just served 10 years for pulling a gun on someone and taking their stuff. Okay, I'm gonna hire the next guy because I have five people applying for the job. Why would I take a risk on you? Well, because maybe he'll turn out the way he turned out. So, exploring the whole nuance of the jail one of the observations um, was that the, change, the shift in demographics over the last 10, 20 years, which you alluded to, is a higher percentage of young individuals, gang-related violence. Has that been your experience, and what do you think could be a potential solution to curtail some of that? Because hearing he, you know, spent 10 years from the age of 17, he was kind of getting involved with the gang again. Right. The solution answer we don't have time for um, because it's long, complex, elusive, um, so many different facets to it. We touched on some of them, plug in with Lead Atlanta and help CJ pull some people out of that. But Ms. Feely, why don't you talk about it? Ms. Feely was a, a public defender in DeKalb for a while, but fairly similar criminal demographics. What have you seen in your clientele um, in a shift over the last five, six years? Younger, different mix of crimes? Yes, and so one of my close friends actually does the SP440s, which is juveniles that are charged as adults. And so the shift on that end also is, you know, 14, you can be charged as an adult at, you know, 13, 14, 15. And it's just absolutely heartbreaking to see just not even start out in life and go down that path of, you know, being charged as an adult. And obviously her goal is to try to get the cases sent back to juvenile court, but we're talking arm robbery you know, murders, that kind of thing at that young age. So I do think it is starting to become our clients are getting, I guess, wrapped up in the system earlier and earlier, unfortunately. Yeah, there, there is a notion um, for some who, if they get here and they've had a real messy juvenile history, we're, we're plugging in too late. Um, we are. Uh, everyone has failed that kid um, by the time he's 16 as an SB 440 here because you can trace it and it was entering autos uh, or shoplifting is where it starts. And then it's um, carjacking or a slider. You slide in, but sometimes sliders slide in when you're at the gas pump and they slide across. They slide across with a gun just so you don't try to do something and younger and younger. And by the time you get here, we don't have the tools that juvenile court has. Um, they're very blunt instruments. And armed robbery is a crime that carries a mandatory minimum 10 years in prison. No matter if you're 16, there's not a, a different rule for a 16-year-old. If you're being prosecuted as an adult and you're found guilty of armed robbery, it's 10 to 20, non-parolable or life. And it actually, one of the more heartbreaking things to me is if a kid does get picked up as a juvenile on their 17th birthday, they come from the RYDC to Rock Street like that day. So it's just really, really hard to see that. Sir, in the back. Um, you. This, this may be a really difficult question to answer, but it, with someone with Mr. Lucky's criminal history were to come in front and, and you were to uh, sentence him today, how, how do you think that might look? Meaning if we, if we took his arrest in 20, 2004, but moved it to now, and he had three drug priors, um, I would try to get him into drug court. That's not my call. I mean, the, the, the prosecutor comes up with a recommendation. I'm not bound by that. Um, but I would push, Mr. Lucky would need to agree, I want to go to drug court. His lawyer would need to advocate for that. But his priors were um, two drug cases and I think an entering auto or something like that. It had all the hallmarks of someone that we talked about earlier today, who is addiction driving the behavior that gets him in trouble with the law, as opposed to evilness or something like that. And so my goal would be, and that's the profile of someone that goes into drug court. It's not their first conviction. It's their third, fourth, fifth, um, generally a little older because they've had enough hard knocks and they've had 
been in and out of jail enough, they want something different because you need to want drug court. It is not a cakewalk. 18, at least 18 months, you're showing up every day. You take UAs all the time. If you test positive, you may have a day or two in jail. It's, it's not a fun, but it's uplifting um, and it is empowering. And he, that is where he would go today is, is to drug court. And think about the difference between going to drug court and a 25 year custodial sentence. Now he may crash and burn in drug court, but that's why it's called accountability court. If he ends up flaming out, then he's going to go to jail and we may get him drug treatment in custody in, in an um, involuntary situation. But we, we give him that chance and we don't even number it. Is it his fifth chance? It's sixth chance. It's his first chance at getting treatment, at getting care and being reconnected or connected for the first time with resources that might help him um, make different decisions. So I think that that would be a classic drug court case. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk about the difference in restrictions that are placed on a person under um, probation versus parole? So the Department of Community Supervision now runs both. They used to be separate. And so the restrictions are very similar, um, but I wouldn't impose the parole conditions. Um, let's say that Mr. George, I'd sentenced him to a year followed by probation with those, you heard me say, um, family violence intervention program, things like that. Um, he might get paroled out early um, because it's all one group. They may well say we are importing your probation conditions and putting them on your parole, but I don't dictate what happens with parole. Just like I can't say, sometimes people say, I'd like to be in a prison near my family. I, I, don't, I don't get to say where, where you get, that's a Department of Corrections decision. Um, there's a complete break in authority once you get to DOC. Sir? I just want to ask, I know that you spoke to some of the programming at the sentencing. Is some of that same programming and other programming required by the ARS started? While they're in custody? Yes. Meaning like a family violence intervention or... Um, again, um, judges aren't able to tell the Department of Corrections what to do while the person's in custody. Um, what I could do is recommend. So to use the, the accountability court example, if modern day Mr. Lucky um, had gone into drug court and it didn't go well, let's say he, he got caught with a gun and some drugs, you're, you're out of drug court if you get caught with a gun. Um, he would have been given a pretty long probation sentence. I would revoke that and he would go to the Department of Corrections with a recommendation from me that he participate in what's called RSAT, which is drug court, but the doors lock on the outside. You can't leave it. You have to do that treatment, but I can only recommend it. Um, DOC then evaluates him and says, eh, he does need it. He doesn't need it. They'll listen to the judge, but they're not bound by that. So we can encourage it. But the programming that you get, if you can get it at DOC is a DOC decision. Um, it's certainly an area where we want to encourage DOC and where investment needs to be made. There are fewer halfway houses now, transitional houses than there used to be because of budget cuts. That's a huge loss because um, that is a, a very, very clogged pipeline. And we want to push as many people through transitional houses as possible because that's re-entry. And otherwise it's this abrupt, you're out, good luck. Here's a bus ticket. And we see how that ends too often. This will be the last question and then I'm going to get jumped. <laughs> are, are there fees attached um, to those under uh, probation? And what happens if you know, they can't get a job, you know, they can't make a living? Right. So yes, their fees. Um, they're they're how much are they per month? Do you know, Ms. Feely? I think it's about thirty-two dollars. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Yeah. I was, I, it used to be twenty-nine. It's apparently gone up. It's thirty-two bucks a month, which you may say Shh, that's not much. For some people, they cannot pay it. So two solutions. One, the defense attorney will often say, Judge, will you please waive the supervision fees for the first four months? My client's going to get a job. It's not going to happen right away because look at his tattoos, look at his criminal history. It's going to take a little while for him to get a job. So I, I simply waive the supervision fees. Number two, more important point, um, you will never go to prison because you can't pay your supervision fees. They may write up you up and say, judge, you need to fuss at this guy because he's earning. I know he's working. He's got two jobs. He's not paying his fees. And so what I do in a situation like that is say, you got, now that I know you're making some money, you got 30 days to start paying. And if you don't, guess what? Community service. You're going to have 20 hours of community service every month. You don't pay. Guess who starts paying right away? 
And again, that's if they're available. There's no poor house here. No one gets locked up for not paying if they are unable to pay. Where the tension is, is when someone is earning and they want to spend it on something else. But it's always needs-based. If you're barely making money and you've got three kids, probation doesn't say, well, we get that first 32 bucks and it's no diapers for junior. That, that's not how it works out. It's the kind of thing that we pay if able. Okay? I, I wanted to add on that with, um, with uh, like a set of re recommendations that I will often make, because um, I'm newer to this courtroom, but I typically, if, especially if confinement time is part of the sentence, I will typically, um, especially if they're represented by a public defender, recommend that um, probation fines and fees be waived for the first year, especially if the defendant has children. Because typically if it's, a, if it's a male who has children and if he says he's on child support, then oftentimes when men get out of jail, they are often in arrears because of their mm -hmm. child support. So they not only have the, the, the fines and fees with probation, but they, all, they also have um, child support that they are behind on as well. So I think that kind of helps create um, an environment where they won't reoffend um, as well. Yeah, that's a great point. It's not meant to be a gotcha thing, the supervision fees. It's just meant to hold you a little bit accountable and have a little stake in it. I have to let you go. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Feely, for coming by. I know you've got a few cases you're working on. I do, but I appreciate having our perspectives. Yeah, that's good. And thank you, Ms. Clark, for sticking around. Thank you, Ron. Ms. Sims, it's been a great week. Thank you for parachuting in. I hope we didn't work you too hard. No, Took a few, please. A yeah, well, good. Same. Well, um, who knows where you'll be next week? That's the exciting part of your job.